Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about changing unavailable relationship patterns, healing unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first you and then others. Every episode, we will talk about actionable advice that you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow your self-worth. I'm Sheena Tubbs. Let's begin. Hello, 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 and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. I am so excited to be with you this week to bring you more resources and support to help you heal from symptoms of love addiction, love avoidance, and love deprivation, and the trauma that causes it to make way for the love that you want and all of your relationships, your relationship with family, romantic partnerships, friendships, and most importantly, your relationship with yourself. And for today's episode, I am super duper excited because we are going to be talking about our relationship with food, um, with diet culture, with our bodies. And I have been wanting to talk about this for a long time. Um, So with me working with women who have intimacy disorders, one thing that you've heard me talk about if you've been in this community for a while is just how this is just one different form of self-medication, that we can self-medicate with relationships, with fantasy, with sex. And oftentimes we will cycle these things out with other things, which is why it goes under the radar, which is why we can overperform in some areas and have high amounts of success and feel like we have everything together while there's another part of our life that's really falling through the cracks. And one of the ways that is really common for the women that I work with is emotional eating and our relationship with food. And I have... You know, I've had different platforms over the years. I've had um, other opportunities and people who've spoken about this, but the need to talk about how we use food to to self soothe and to nurture is a really distinct one. And I was so happy when I came across the platform of our guest today, Dr. Ebony Butler, who's just a phenomenon, and you're going to love this episode as you listen to her. But I wanted to have someone who could talk about this issue that I felt everybody who listened could relate to that, especially those of us who who live in black and brown bodies. And so she's she did a wonderful job. So before we jump into that episode, I just wanted to share something that I am grateful for. As you know, practicing gratitude and getting present with what is happening today and not things that might happen in the future that may make you anxious and not things that should have happened in the past, which will just make you feel very powerless and stressed out um, as you might battle with regret or whatever might come up for you. Focusing on all the things that are present here for you today is one of the best tools that you can use in your everyday life. So wherever you are, Whatever you're doing, whether you're taking a walk or driving or you're sneaking to listen to a podcast while you're at work or your kid is pulling on your shirt, I just want you to take a breath, breathe in, hold it for three, and exhale for three. And I want you to bring to mind something that you're grateful for. And if there's a thought that comes to mind that's like, oh, everything is really messed up right now. Okay, that might be part of your reality. And I'm not going to negate that. But with all of the things that may be swirling around you right now, what is something that you can practice some gratitude for right now in this moment? Was it that you got a parking spot close to the grocery store the other day? Was it that there was an extra donut for you waiting at work? Was it that your favorite TikToker came back after a hiatus? Was it that someone helped you out with the bill? You know, gratitude is something that we can practice for the big and the small things that we need to. We need to turn our attention towards the abundance of what we have because that is what grows and that's what manifests versus the lack. 
And I want you to notice that as you're doing this and even as how I slow down my speech, what is coming up for you in your body? Are you able to sit and be present with the moment? As you think about the thing that you are grateful for right now, are you able to experience joy? And if so, where do you feel it in your body? And as you focus on that joy, does it grow? Does it make you feel warm inside? Does it make you want to smile? And can you let yourself sit with that feeling? Can you let yourself receive that joy? You know, one of the end effects of, or one of the end results of healing our trauma is being able to receive pleasure, to play, to sit in happiness, to not be afraid of the next shoe dropping. And when people love on us, we experience it with gratitude and we accept it. And we can give the same to other people as well. And we get there by practicing moments like this. I think sometimes it can be easy to believe that healing is all intellectual. So I'm going to listen to the podcast. I'm going to read the books. I'm going to talk and talk and talk in therapy. And all of these definitely get us to many of the milestones that we are looking for in our healing process. However, those things that I just listed are very much um, external or what, what we say in the therapy world, which is top down. So that means we try to heal starting with our brain and hoping that our brain will try to get everything else in control and fix everything. And our brain is definitely very powerful, but we also carry trauma in our bodies. That is why sometimes you do need to self-nurture with something like food or you feel like you need to self-nurture with food. You do want the arms of someone else outside of you, even when that person might not be good for you. Um, Why it may be hard for you to sit still and you always live your life on overdrive why your body may have aches and pains and soreness that is unexplained. No matter how many times you go to a masseuse or a chiropractor or a doctor, um, nothing seems to work because your body is talking to you. Your body is very much aware of what you need, but when you may have a disconnection from your body and you don't know how to listen and be attuned and be present in the moment, you will constantly live your life in fight or flight. Um, this body work stuff is some of the things that I teach my students in my bigger program in my recovery school coaching program, which is my private coaching. And I, I've just been thinking about how this is so pivotal for everybody. Like everyone needs to know how to do this body work. Um, and I think it needs to be a part of everyone's everyday practice. And so that's why I'm taking time today in this introduction when we're talking about self-soothing and we're talking about connecting to, um, learning how to connect to ourselves and love ourselves to kind of give us a moment to maybe practice being grounded or think about, do I ever feel grounded? And when I do, what is it that I need? And if I don't, what is it that I need to get there? So hopefully this was helpful for y'all to have this this break in between as we get into this topic. Um, Body work is definitely going to be one of the things that I'm going to also teach the ladies who are part of the Healed and Loved membership. For those of you who don't know, I've only been talking about it a little bit in in some places, especially in our um, text community where I send out inspiration a couple times a week. Um, And if you're not on that list, it's free. You can find it in the show notes. Um, just text the number and then you'll be on the list and I'll be sending you love um, and sending you support a few times a week um, to not, you know, clog your box. But anyways, for the ladies who joined that membership, um, I was like, I have to talk about helping black women 
getting in touch with their bodies and teaching you exercises and tools that you can do in your own time to add to your daily practice, to be able to tell where your feelings are in your body. Um, A lot of you are already doing this work when you do things like yoga. Some of you may already be doing other types of body work and dance and movement, and this is all amazing stuff. And it'll this will just be something to su- supplement what you're already doing. And just really quickly, for those of y'all who are like, membership, I didn't know that there was going to be a membership. Yes, it's going to be a smaller program um, that just has a monthly workshop where we will take a deep dive into any topic, into a topic around being a healed and loved woman. Um, we are going to open doors this month and we are going to talk this month about finding our voice and showing up for ourselves and what does that look like? And I will be giving you challenges and giving you action steps to take to practice what you learn in the workshop that month. And every month we're going to build on the next. And hopefully this will be a resource that women can use in their everyday life. Busy women women who are dedicated to the process, but they don't really have a lot of um, access to resources. I wanted to make it something that everyone could be a part of. And so, um, so yeah, you can join our text list if you want to learn more about that. I will absolutely talk about it more next podcast episode, um, but definitely check out our show notes to learn more. So, That's it, y'all, for the intro. Let's go ahead and get into this amazing episode with Dr. Ebony, and I will see you after the jump. Okay, so today on the podcast, I have Dr. Ebony. Hey, Dr. Ebony. Hey, how are you? I am doing wonderful. I was telling you right before, I'm very excited about our chat and the wealth of knowledge that you are going to bring to the Black Girl Tail audience and all the resources because you are full of resources. So um, I'm so happy that you're here. I appreciate that. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So for those who are not familiar with you and your amazing platform, can you go ahead and tell us all about yourself? Absolutely. But hey, y'all, I am Dr. Ebony. I'm a licensed psychologist and food relationship strategist. Um, As a psychologist, my area of expertise is trauma recovery, uh, particularly working with Black women and other people of color around healing, um, interpersonal trauma, so there's trauma that's happened at the hands of someone else, as well as racial trauma, um, identity work, um, self-exploration, that kind of thing. And then on the food relationship side of things, I work as a coach where I help strategize, work alongside women where we strategize how they can build healthier relationships with food. A lot of people think when they hear that title that I'm all about like weight loss and healthy eating. And that's not what it is um, because diet culture kind of sends this or kind of spreads this message that your worth is tied to the food that you eat. A lot of us feel really horrible about ourselves. We have a lot of anxiety, guilt, ridden relationships with food. And I work with women around building healthier interactions with food, not particularly telling people what to eat but helping people show up empowered in the food choices that they make for themselves, whether that leads to weight loss or not, just knowing that you have full power and control over your body, you make your own rules and and how we can find our power in an otherwise oppressive culture. Oh, Dr. Evan, we haven't gotten started (laughs) in just your introduction. Um, Thank you for that. That sounds wonderful. Um, We are absolutely going to focus on feeling empowered in our relationship with food. And so again, that's why I'm very excited that you're here. Before we get into that, though, um, I'm just curious about your background, you know, especially with the training that it takes to become a psychologist. I'm wondering, how did you come to a place where you were more focused on healing trauma, healing intergenerational trauma and food, our relationship with food? Yeah, it all just happened to kind of, I don't, I don't know, very much like happenstance if anybody knows anything about grad school you know that you go into grad school with an idea of what you want to do and then you end up doing what your advisor wants you to do because you need to graduate um and so I was lucky enough to pair with an advisor who was doing something that I was interested in as it related to women and sexuality um sexuality development identity and so I just naturally took hold of that and I wanted to 
moved from just understanding sexual identity and development to understanding trauma. So I mm-hmm. went to training in trauma specifically at the VA, which is if you're going to the Veterans Affairs uh, system. So if you're going to learn about trauma, that's a really good place to just learn about the basics of trauma, what trauma looks like, all of the golden standards for treating trauma, that kind of thing. And then I went on to do an internship in trauma, military sexual trauma uh, at the VA. And then I went on to another VA and did a two-year postdoc in women's health. So my focus all along has always been about women, trauma recovery, healthy sexuality, healthy identity, that kind of thing. And I've always known that I was particularly keen on wanting to work with people of color, women of color, uh, Black women. So, you know, after you get your degree and need your credentials and your licensing, you kind of just do what you have to do in order to kind of get your job, get your hours, get get that, that training that you need. And so I've worked in agencies for a long time and still work with one now where I'm specifically working with trauma around military veterans and paramilitary organizations. So helping them recover from trauma on the, on the job or childhood trauma, that kind of thing. It wasn't until 2019 that I actually decided that I wanted to open up my own practice to work with my population of choosing, which is Black women. And so Mm -hmm. now that's what I do. I work full-time with a paramilitary organization, helping people recover from the things that they see while on the job. And then in my private practice, I work with Black women, other people of color, people with marginalized identities around healing from sexual trauma, racial trauma, that kind of thing. And then the Mm -hmm. food relationship side of my life is just totally separate, separate, but, but connected. So I went on my own journey to lose weight and I started out in 2015 as actually a weight loss coach, a health and wellness coach. And what I found was that while working with Black women in that particular part of my work, I felt like there's something missing here. There's, I don't want to tell people how to lose weight. That's how I started the business, but something just felt like there was something deeper here. There's something that dealing with mindset and behavior here that as a psychologist, I cannot ignore. So I continued to do my work and I continued to learn. And it wasn't until I kind of got around 2017 that I started to pivot in that part of the business where I realized that this feels oppressive to me. I feel like I'm doing the same thing to people that has always been done to us and that's make us feel like crap for the weight that we can't lose. So I started to just dive a little bit deeper internally into myself to see what I wanted to do. And I started educating myself more about the oppression around diet culture. And that's when I realized that this is why this has never felt completely aligned with me because this feels very oppressive and sticky and that is not my jam. And so I Mm -hmm. decided I wasn't gonna use the health and wellness culture, weight loss culture identity anymore, but I needed to find something that fit. And I'm a very big relationship person. I talk about relationships all the time at work. Even if it's not, you know, uh, a person to person relationship, the things that we do with ourselves, the relationships where we communicate with other people, that kind of thing. And I was like, there's a relationship that we have with food and ourselves that's heavily impacted by our mindset, by our behaviors and by our emotional triggers. So let me dive into that more. So that's how I came up with the food relation, the food relationship strategist title, because I recognize that nothing else fit for me. So I actually made that up, Sheena. Um, Mm -hmm. So I made up food relationship strategies and I was like, that feels better because I'm strategizing with people, not telling people what to do. And so if you think about trauma, interpersonal trauma, racial trauma, you can't think about those without also understanding the history of what has happened in this country and this world around food and our bodies. So they ended up blending together with, but at first I was trying to keep them separate, but I can't keep them separate because they're all interconnected. And that a lot of times when we've experienced betrayal and harm at the hands of somebody else, we a lot of times turn that inward for protection and try to control our foods in in ways that we might not otherwise feel control in our lives. Um, And so also racial trauma, when you're thinking about the oppression and systemic issues that exist, many times people who look like us don't have access to food because of those systems. So when we're thinking about weight loss, we dwindle it down diet culture dwindles it down and minimizes it to the individual but you really can't put all the onus on the individual without putting onus on the systems that created access issues resource issues education issues in the first place and so if we go broadly these things end up being really connected Mm -hmm. yep um i love how you're talking about the intersection between systems of oppression 
um, societal expectations of what our body should and shouldn't look like, even cultural expectations of us as Black women right. of what our body should look like, and then what we eat and what feels good and how we self-soothe and just helping people strategize and feel empowered in their decisions. I love that that is, I th- love that that is your focus. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. So how does one start this work if someone's listening and thinking, yeah, well, well, first let me back up a little bit more because you gave a great explanation, but how would someone know if they themselves have an unhealthy relationship with food? I tell people to think about it like a relationship with a person because I think we get real heady about a relationship with food because we we don't really hear this concept very often and when we get really heady we can get really disconnected and it doesn't feel like it's a thing that we can actually tackle and it feels overwhelming so I always talk about it in terms of like a relationship with another person I even describe what I do in terms of like what a relationship coach does so let's start there a relationship Mm -hmm. coach doesn't tell you who you should date they work with you to figure out how you want to show up in that interaction that relationship They help you build skills to be healthier, more empowered in that relationship, but they're not going to tell you who to date. That's the same thing for a relationship, for relationship strategist. I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I'm going to empower you, help you build skill, um, gain tools around how to show up in a way that feels authentic and empowering to you versus me telling you what to do because that's never worked for anybody. So if you think about those in that term, you would find a little bit less apprehension around working with somebody like me because you're not being told what to eat. And also it actually scares people because diet culture has conditioned us so that we think we need to be told what to eat. So when I tell people, I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I'm going to empower you to figure out what your body wants, what your body needs. And people are like, oh my God, I don't know how to do that because for so long we learned, you know, trauma either takes us out of connecting with our bodies or we've gotten so used to diet culture diet gurus telling us what we need to do for our body so we don't know what that actually sounds like and it feels very unfamiliar but very much like a relationship coach my job is not to tell you who to date just tell you how to build the skills to show up so from there you would think about what in a relationship with a person do I want what are my values what are my negotiables what are my non-negotiables how do I want to act in this relationship how do I want to feel we have a checklist. I mean, like, just be real. I tell my audience all the time, let's, let's be real. You already know what type of person you want to be partnered with. You have a checklist. Let's take that same checklist and skill over to food. How do you want to feel? How do you want to interact? What do you want to be the takeaway feeling? What do you want to, what do you want to think about yourself when you're with that person? Like all of these things is how we want to show up with food. If we're showing up with food from a place of anxiety, restriction, rules 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 think about how that would sort of play if you were in a relationship with a person what if you had all of these rules that you had with the person that you were trying to get to know or that you had known and y'all are trying to work on the relationship what if that person came to the table with you can't do this you can't do this this is on this list this is on that list you can't do that after seven you can't do this on the weekends you can only do this on Sundays how would you feel with that person you would feel like you were being controlled and that's how many of us are showing up in our relationship with food so I, we already have the skill. We have to transfer it over and start thinking about it in this food area. Mm-hmm. Listening to you talk about that, I think about one common struggle I see when it comes to restricting um, with food is the shame that comes with it. And so mm-hmm. if someone were to say food is here for your pleasure and enjoyment, maybe an immediate response to uh, food is not for enjoyment. Food is for sustenance and just to make sure I get through it. And I think about the connection to how sometimes it's so hard for women, people in general, but also women to receive pleasure and the idea that something can be just for your enjoyment and that is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring up a really good point that I think is also going back to systemic issues, right? Patriarchy, Mm -hmm. misogyny, like our pleasure is is not something that we should seek. And... Mm -hmm diet culture kind of has those overtones you -hmm. should enjoy food you should definitely only eat food who wants to live like that Mm -hmm. that is that is torture actually why don't we get to enjoy food food is everywhere food is culture food is a large part of our culture especially so why is that being stripped from me 
we think about white supremacy that a lot of that is why like a lot of our culture has been stripped from us hidden from us taken from us so that we know no we know no origins right and so when we think about our food those are some of the last things that we're holding on to and so people find that you know when they start these extreme diets they may say to themselves i just don't have the discipline i just don't have the 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 control and it's not that you don't but something higher is at play here and maybe you are connecting with culture and tradition and ancestry that you don't even realize is happening mm. and you might not be able to stick to the diet because diet is taking that away from you and your body is resisting that and so we have to get to a place where we recognize what balance feels like for us and recognize that we are deserving of pleasure even in the area of food and pleasure does not make us bad people So a lot of these things that we have come to believe, we've got to unlearn and us not having pleasure in food and not being able to eat good food and eating and enjoying food being tied to um, sort of like badness, sins, that kind of thing. We've got to really unlearn that in order to step into a healthier relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And to add to that, I wonder if you have thoughts about just body image, because there's the impact of like supremacy, systemic oppression, but I also think about sexism and how a lot of times it can come from watching mothers or mother figures or other people, other women in our lives who have negative relationships with food. And so the idea of restriction or indulgence is about staying skinnier or staying thick, depending on whatever it is. And so that looks like a lot of body shame or or with how food impacts your body. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Absolutely. You can't have one without the other, right? So our relationship mm-hmm. with food is definitely going to impact how we feel about our bodies. You no, know, you know, in the same ways that our relationship with people is going to impact how we show up in conversation, in intimacy, in comfortability in our bodies around them. Our bodies are going to give us messages about whether we're tense around people or whether we can just uh, be free. And so the same thing happens on the food relationship side. And even more so because we are, we get these messages of, um, of standards of beauty and what our bodies are supposed to look like. And, and many times the models are coming from those people who've taken care of us and how they felt about their bodies because they're also born into diet culture. They're born into these systemic issues. Um, so body image is huge and learning how to have a relationship with your body is also a part of building a healthy relationship with food because they impact the other. If you have a negative um, relationship with your body or a very challenging and difficult one, you're going to have a difficult relationship with food because food is also helping to shape that body that you either love or or don't like, Mm -hmm. you know? So I definitely think they are uh, connected and we we have to continue to to kind of have that conversation about how they play off of each other because it's definitely there. I do believe, here's a resource that I want to share with your audience and they may have heard it before, but there's a book called Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings. That book was so eye-opening for me and it gives the historical context of the the way diet culture started and how all diet culture is rooted in anti-Blackness. So to be Mm. in a Black body and to also try to feel empowered in that body goes against everything that our culture is built around as it relates to health and wellness because it all was set up to be in opposition of bodies that look like ours. Hmm. I have just written that book down and I will be picking it up. Thank you so much. I had not heard of that book before. Life but... changing, life hmm. changing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can't wait. Awesome. Well, you kind of um, started what my question was going to be about body image, which is how does one begin the process of unlearning these messages around body image and food? Yeah, I think that people have to really do some values work. I think that's a really good good place to start because values are those things that are important to you. And if we sit down and really do some values work, we'll really see that a lot of times what we're striving for is out of alignment with our own values. So values are things like um, in value areas, we can have values as relates to relationships, work, career, leisure, spirituality. And so these things are guiding principles around what is important in our lives. So if I value health and I value health because I want energy and I want um, to be able to 
breathe a little bit lighter. I want to be able to sleep, like defining those areas and getting really in tune with what health looks like. Health is also not related to any of that, but I want to laugh more. Mm. I want to be in the present more. I want my skin to clear up. I want to work on some of these things that is causing me to feel fatigued throughout the day. That stuff is values work that may have nothing to do with diets, weight loss. So when you find that you are grabbing, like you look at your body and you're like, oh, my body is disgusting. It repulses me. Why? How does that align with any of your values? Maybe if your body is not one that has good energy or high energy in the ways that you would like it. Okay, so maybe we can start there with doing some work. Maybe you've noticed some pain. We need to start there. But those things are usually, when you're talking about body image, not even on the same plane. Many times we're talking about reaching an ideal standard that has nothing to do with health. And and sometimes people believe that a a skinnier body equates to health and that's not the same. Mm -hmm. Getting healthy is not equal to weight loss. Weight loss is not equal to health, right? And so I think that when we bring our values into play, we can reconcile and maybe begin to adopt this idea that, hey, I'm getting more energy. My body's not shrinking. And that's still okay with me. It might happen for some people. It might not happen for others. But if the only goal we're looking at is for a body to shrink, then we may find ourselves in some very frustrated places. We may find ourselves very upset at our bodies and not giving our bodies credit for the work that it's doing for us and with us because it's not doing what we've been taught is the only way to to define and quantify our health, which is by a number. So Mm. values work allows you to take out from a broader perspective those things that are also important. Weight loss makes you focus on a number. Body image makes you focus on a standard. And so how do we begin to adopt this idea that our body image is comprised of more than just a shape? an ideal beauty standard, a certain clothing fit, but that is comprised of so much. How was my oxygen level? Can I touch my body and thank my arms for getting me throughout the day? That's what I want people to eventually get to as far as it relates to body image. But many of us aren't there because we think about body image as far as just big, fat, little, small, those kinds of things, or you know, skinny, fit, those things. And diet coach is largely to blame for that. The clothing industry is largely to blame for that. So our focus is, we're hyper-focused on how we look, what clothes we fit in naturally because the world is not set up for larger bodies to feel comfortable in this space. So I get it. And we're missing a lot more. So if we can do some values work, it's not going to change overnight because I still struggle with this myself. And I have to constantly recognize or constantly remind myself that, hey, your legs got you through this workout. Or yes, you have some back fat and you just ran six miles. Not, I need to get rid of this back fat because when Mm -hmm. I did get rid of it, I couldn't run six miles. But now that you have it, you can run six miles. But what's that trade-off? What's that conversation like with yourself, with your body? And I found myself in my workout the other day rubbing my arms and saying, thank you so much. I'm just thankful for this skin that continues to show up for me even when I choose to speak against it. These are the types of things that continues to help us create a better body image and a good place to start. Language and values and figuring out what we're saying to ourselves and if any of this stuff that we're striving towards is in alignment with those values. Many of us don't even have a clue what our values are. Mm. I love that, Dr. Ebony. I love that so much. And Mm -hmm. just hearing the the themes of self-compassion and self-acceptance in there is so key, so mm-hmm. key when we're talking about healing trauma and all the narratives that have taught us to not accept ourselves, to demonize ourselves, to um, to belittle ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to minimize ourselves down to a body part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when you look around and we talk about empowerment, like I am so much more than the skin I pick at then the body part I pick at, like all of this, all of this is worthy. All of this makes up who I am and all of this is welcome to take up space and it doesn't have to be perfect to do so. And I think you bring up a really good point that there is, actually there is no perfect and trauma kind of, you know, in our recovery, our quest to try to recover from trauma, we kind of sometimes become perfectionists. 
mm-hmm. or to overcome some inadequacy, we become perfectionists. And a lot of people I work with turn that perfectionism on their bodies. So when I say bodies that aren't perfect, that's what I'm talking about because we perceive this imperfection. It doesn't mean that it is. It's a perception that it is. And we kind of minimize ourselves down to that area, those areas. And we continue to try to work at it. I also want to make sure that I am clear with your audience around. I am, a, I am a huge advocate of doing with your body what you want. Doing with your body what you want because it's yours, right? And then also understanding why we do some things. And if doing that to your body helps you feel empowered, does it help you feel great in your skin? Because I think you can do with your, you can change your body in ways that feel good to you. And understanding, is this a trauma response though? And and are any of these things that I'm doing going to help me feel more empowered? Or is this going to be a catalyst for me finding more issues with my body that I can now correct, air quotes. So I spent a lot of time working with women around having that conversation. Like, yeah, sure. You want to go on a diet? Let's do that. According to your values, which of these things, which, how does that act then get you closer to any of these values? What is it in, what is it in alignment with? For some people, it is going to create a healthier lifestyle for them. For some people, it is a trauma response and in a way to regulate themselves and control their, themselves. And, and when I say control themselves, control the anxiety and shame that they feel around their bodies. So they're latching on to weight loss as a hope for freedom that and we have that conversation around. That may not ever bring you the freedom that you think. And I am here to walk the path with you to see if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yep. That sounds wonderful. Um, I would love to kind of double back as well to um, the other part of your specialization. Well, it's all connected, but mm-hmm. the food relationship strategies part. So one of the reasons why I was so excited to connect with you is, as you know, you know, I focus on intimacy disorders and love addiction, love avoidance and mm-hmm. attachment and all the self-soothing that goes along when we self-medicate with relationships, sex, fantasy and all that stuff. And one of the things that um, that I've noticed is what we will do, what women will do, especially high functioning women, is we will stop our um, some addictive behaviors or addictive patterns with one thing and interchange it with another thing, right? With Mm co-addiction. And so with women, the top three things that I notice is you might break up with a relationship or cut off a codependent pattern, but then you start self-medicating with food or then you start Mm -hmm. self-medicating with shopping or work or whatever it might be. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what self-medication with food looks like when we are, when we're feeling triggered or sad or lonely or anything else you might've seen in your own practice. Absolutely. And I'm going to write that word down because I want to make sure I come back to it as I talk about um, weight loss after I answer this one. So of course, you know, we hear the term emotional eating, right? And Mm -hmm. emotional eating has has just gotten, just has a very bad reputation. And there is nothing wrong with emotional eating. We all have emotionally ate and are probably emotional eaters. Why not, right? Our emotions sometimes are built around certain foods. Like when we celebrate, we want food. That's also an emotion. When we're happy, right? I'm a happy emotional eater. So that's my emotion that leads me to eat. Some people's emotions that lead them to eat are boredom, loneliness, those kinds of things. But when I'm happy, I want to celebrate with food. Here's where we get ourselves in trouble, though, and why emotional eating has gotten a bad reputation. If that's the only skill that we're using or that's the Mm -hmm. only thing that we have to turn to, and that thing is also causing some very negative consequences for us or causing us to be out of alignment with ourselves and our values. That's when emotional eating kind of has a uh, comes into play and it becomes problematic. Emotionally eating in and of itself is not bad. It's what the consequences are for people and it's whether or not it allows you to be in alignment with your values and not that. And if that's taking you out of alignment or causing more dysfunction in your life, that's when I would define it with the people I work with around whether or not this is problematic, okay? And Mm so I I have seen people turn to food, especially people who have experienced some sort of significant interpersonal trauma earlier in life, turning to food for coping, Mm -hmm. self-medicating. And one of the things that we we dig into is where did you first learn this as a coping skill? And many of it goes way, way back to our baby years where we were soothed with food um, and soothed and comforted with food type activities. 
Um, and so that is a very innate and very um, almost concrete coping skill that people have. And some people have used food because food was the only thing they control, they could control in otherwise uncontrollable circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you get that piece. And so our work sometimes is around learning different coping skills. What other things can you do? What other things can you use? Expanding the coping skill repertoire is where a lot of our work uh, actually land. And so helping people figure out what else they can do because food as a go-to is easy, it's accessible. For some people, especially high achieving women, if we stick there and talk about this population, it's accessible, it's, um, it's convenient, it's legal, it is everywhere, right? It's a part of actually the success model the luxury mm-hmm. food, luxury dining experiences too. And so it really becomes hard to let that go because it's connected to so many different parts of the high achieving woman's identity. The part that a lot of people don't realize too is when they get of age and they start to become high achieving, food, turning to food for coping is also a sign of freedom and an act of independence and liberation. Because now you have money and finances to buy food that you probably didn't have before. And so Mm -hmm. that too can become a way that you actually cope by reminding yourself of who you are, where you are, your status in life. And so when I don't feel well, I have to remind myself that I can go out and buy a steak and eat an appetizer and a dessert and order two drinks if I want. I don't have to choose. There I am feeling liberated in spaces where I might not, you know, in spaces where otherwise might not feel liberated. So that piece we can't we can't neglect as we talk about self-medication. Sometimes this is a response to regulating ourselves and soothing ourselves because that liberation makes us feel grounded. It reminds us of how far we've come and it reminds us of just where we are. And that can be problematic too if we're neglecting the consequences and dysfunction that this can be causing in our lives. I talk to people and friends who spent $1,500 a month eating out out of a trauma response and not knowing that feeling lonely, feeling rejected. And so the way that they feel whole again or complete, taking themselves out and reminding themselves that, you know, this narrative that we have, or I can do for myself. You know, I don't need relationships. I can do this myself. So that self-medication, that need to self-medicate with food grows stronger and that pattern is strengthened. So I see that a lot. What I wanted to come back to was sometimes we self-medicate with weight loss and don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are turning towards weight loss as a regulation tool of the, because of the emotions that we feel. And if we can just get some control over that, then we'll feel all right. And for, I, I, was listening, I was reading an article actually, and the more successful a woman is, the more thin she believes she has to be. Hmm. And if you think about it, we bec- the more successful we become, the more we, turn inter- the more we internalize a lot of the fat phobia, a lot of the diet culture things. It's like, well, how more, how, you know, because that's the only thing I'm not achieving in my life. And I've heard so many women say this. is I got everything else. Why can't I succeed at this? So we're looking at yet another thing that we can excel in. And so if we can just get this, then we can prove to ourselves again that we are successful and capable of achieving whatever we put our minds to, right? And when it doesn't happen for me, it's like, well, what? wait, I can't do that. What is wrong with me? Not realizing that that's not, nothing's wrong with you. You're just trying to do the impossible because we think that this is a part of who we should be as successful women. So first of all, Dr. Ebony, I don't appreciate you coming on my podcast, <laughs> telling me about me. You're supposed to be educating everybody else. And so I feel read, I feel seen. Um, and I really appreciate what you just, yeah. <laughs> what you just shared. <laughs> um, no, that is so powerful. Um, also just a couple things that you said made me think of also the intersection with money trauma, which is not, mm. you know, what we're focusing on, but, um, what you were talking about, just the luxury dining experience or using food and going out as a reminder that we are safe or that we've made it. Mm -hmm. So how much of, um, how much of flexing online involves Mm. posting pictures of you going to brunch or how many mimosas you had or how good the steak was. Right. And that is evidence, um, that you are okay and that you're validated and what that also does to your self image and all of all the things that we've been talking about. 
all of that is connected. And I think that, you know, when we talk about one trauma, we, we have to bring into context many others because there usually isn't one just happening at, the, at that time. So money mm-hmm. trauma, issues that people have around money, scarcity. Scarcity mm-hmm. mindset is a very huge issue as we talk about food relationship and body image. So if I'm dealing with scarcity and I've always been a person who's lived in scarcity, of course, I'm going to flex on the gram for y'all. Of course, I'm, I'm going to, to, to get all of that. I'm going to get more of what I actually need because my mind and my anxiety tells me that this may somehow be taken away from me in the future. And I don't mm. want to face that devastation because that devastation is familiar and I don't want to go back there. So you would have a lot of people uh, kind of acting out of that scarcity mindset that gets in the way of their relationship with food. I think about it in terms of a relationship with a person. If you're in a relationship with somebody who has a scarcity mindset, they're going to be afraid of commitment because they're going to view commitment as being something that's going to take, that's going to be something that's going to take something else away from them. So if I commit here, then I lose access to everything else. Mm -hmm. When that actually isn't the case. So on the side of food relationship, if I commit to, doing this one thing I gotta go all in and that's gonna take everything else off the table for me which is why that doesn't last long because the way you're thinking about it is actually faulty and irrational because a commitment doesn't close off access to anything else it's just that this is the value as it stands in this point of your life right now and everything else is available to you if you wanted to do that just understand that there might be some consequences as you're in a relationship with some other people that may not go over well so you can still have access. Commitment doesn't take away that. You just have to make sure that you're in a relationship that honors your ability to have access. And so that's a whole nother thing that we can get into. But at the core, I want people to understand that going into these things with a scarcity mindset creates more problems than solutions. And if we recognize that commitment opens me up to so many more possibilities to learn myself, it opens me up to so many more possibilities to bond in a way that I never have in a safe environment. It opens me up to learn more about somebody else and to learn to build skill. That's abundance versus, oh, that's going to take something from me. Mm -hmm. And then on the food side of things, everything is available to me. I'll eat what I want. I'll leave what I don't want. And I have the ability to do that. And if I want everything available to me, then me teaching myself that I can have what I want is a new skill that I'm allowing myself to step into and learn. And so it's a matter of changing perception and perspective and language and how we, if we're in anxiety mode, survival mode, we're always going to be coming from a space of scarcity and fear. Mm-hmm. Well, if the people listening are like me, I am like frothing at the mouth waiting for <laughs> the resources that you're going to give. But before I ask you about um, how do we work through this or resources or next steps you have, is there anything around this topic that I haven't asked about that you think would be important for the audience to know? Yeah, I, I think that um, we talked about self-compassion, right? And I think you just mentioned it. And I would like to just expound on that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Compassion is not the same thing as self-love, right? Because I hear a lot of diet culture saying, well, if you love yourself enough, you do this. And I don't want to confuse those two because self-compassion is recognizing that you are on a journey. And that you you can love yourself and you can also not like some part of yourself. And that does also that doesn't mean that you are somehow flawed or inadequate, but allowing yourself to, to be gentle with yourself and almost teach yourself and treat yourself like you would a child and to offer some of that compassion because that's more sustainable than this whole thing around. Well, if you just love yourself enough, you get it together. That's real. That message has gotten so. Um, inundated with this punishment field that I feel like self-compassion may be what we need to gravitate towards more. And even if I don't like myself today, I can still have compassion for myself. We can think about people that's in our lives regularly. We don't like them, but we can be compassionate towards them. And so you're not going to wake up every day just loving on yourself immensely, but you can also have compassion for yourself at the same time. You might not like how you acted with somebody, And you can still have compassion to recognize that there are some things you might want to change. So compassion is leaning in with a certain softness that allows you to continue to progress. And I don't want us to get stuck on either you love yourself or you don't, but lean in with some compassion because that is needed for a trauma recovery journey. And that is needed as we build our relationship with food because 
while we are trying to unlearn some things, we have to remember that diet culture is getting stronger and more innovative. And the language is changing right along with us. So the things that we're trying to unlearn, we're continuously being shown that on social media, in the news. I mean, they now have a diet program that has brought psychology into the mix. So people don't know what to believe. So be gentle with yourself around the messages that you're receiving because it can get confusing and exhausting. And more than anything, we're going to need to lean in with that compassion and gentleness because the frustration is going to be real. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So let's jump into these resources. So what are your favorite yeah. resources when it comes to working through this? And please, please feel free to share resources that you have as well. Absolutely. So I want to go back to Sabrina Strings book, Fearing the Black Body. I would say start there. We've got so many. So Fearing the Black Body. I would also say pick up um, Body Keeps the Score. The Body Keeps the Score. This is a trauma book. Okay. This book is by, let me bring up the name. The book is by, I'm going to mess this up, Bessel van der Kolk. And this mm-hmm. is a trauma book that talks about the ways that our body remembers what happens to us. So many times we're thinking that we're just having an adverse reaction to some type of food or something. And it could be our trauma showing up and it could be our bodies remembering what has happened to us. That's a really, really, really good book. The Body Keeps the Score. I also want to shout out um, the self-care prescription by Dr. Robin Gobin. She's a psychologist who has put together a self-care workbook um, that you can kind of, you can fill it in and work through it. And then Urban Trauma, which is a book again about trauma by Dr. Maisa, M-A-Y-S-A, Akbar, A-H-K-B-A-R. And then I definitely have to talk about my therapy cards, which is my uh, product that was created for black women and girls, teen girls to help us work through mindset, habits, and triggers. And you can definitely use them in the area of food relationship. So I created these cards to help give us a space in the mental health field to be represented and give ourselves permission to do work um, in a field that has not always considered us. So my therapy cards is a deck of cards that's sectioned into three categories. You got mindset, that's gonna help you figure out some of those judgments that you hold about yourself. And then you got habits, that's gonna help us figure out those behaviors and routines that we're holding on to that could be keeping us stuck. And then triggers, how to respond to emotions, how to recognize emotions, how to name emotions, how to label them, and how to then learn new coping skills to deal with them and manage them. So this deck is available on mytherapycards.com. And I absolutely love uh, working with this. Therapists use this with their clients. I use it with my clients. And you can use it by yourself or with your girlfriends. Uh, But it's to help us dig deeper and do some work. There are 32 cards in the deck. And I tell people to work on one card per week. So that way you have 32 weeks worth of work. And you can use this in addition to therapy or to kind of figure out if you would even want to go to therapy. And then your therapist can use them with you to give you homework assignments or to generate communication and conversation in session. Yes. And to hype up my therapy cards even more, not only are they beautifully packaged and featuring Um, um, beautiful drawings of women that look like us and celebrate us. It also comes, and correct me if I'm wrong, it comes with an accompanying journal if you want it to go even deeper into the process um, to help you work through your thoughts, your values, like you talked about today, um, and helping you create next steps. Yes, yes. So the journal was created out of, you know, everybody saying, well, what what can I write it? Are you going to come up with a journal? So I created a journal for both the adult deck and as well as the teen girl deck. Yes, they are such great resources. Awesome. Great. Well, I know of a couple other resources that you have. Don't you have a podcast as well? I do have a podcast. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, thank you, Sheena. I do have a podcast. The podcast is called Food Is Not Bay. Um, And on there, I talk about different topics as uh, far as kind of like the Black church and, and our way. COVID, I, I did a, a, a episode on that. Um, I just started season four. My next episode would be a topic around is really not about the food um, anyway. And so I'll be talking about that. And I talk about a lot of issues that I just think we are not, we are missing where we're kind of just thinking about weight loss and thinking about dieting and I talk about a lot of oppression and trauma and that kind of thing. So head over to anywhere you listen to your podcast and it's called Food Is Not Bay. And I tell you what that means and everything. Um, I also have a, a group coaching program that's um, 
ending open, open enrollment now, but you can do the masterclass, which is a program that you can get to kind of do some foundational work to begin the steps and where you can start to heal your relationship with food. So I'll walk you through that whole process that I've created. And you can find that on my website um, at dreebony.com. Perfect. I love all of that. And also, um, it, it sounds like you still do see clients privately who for therapy. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes, I am. Um, I am booked in full right now. So I have a waiting <laughs> list. And I typically you can only work with clients who are residents of the state that you're licensed. So I'm licensed in Texas. And so people who are in Texas, if you're interested, you can send me an email um, to info at drebony.com. And I do want to be fair and just let you know that I do have a wait list right now. But I'm happy to to include you on that wait list if you're interested or provide you other people in Texas who I think are fantastic. Great. Yes. I wanted to make sure I plug that because I'm always getting requests from people who are like, do you have a therapist recommendation? And mm. I just think you're phenomenal. So I wanted people to know that they could reach out even if they need to be on a wait list um, yeah. to get a spot. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> That's actually how the cards came about is because I recognized I couldn't see everybody and I was like, let me create something. So that's why I created my therapy cards. I actually put the questions that I asked my clients into this deck. So if you feel like you're in another city. It's like, oh, I thought she was so nice. I, I thought she was dope. I want to kind of see what it's like to work with her. You can get these cards and there are some questions in there that can help you do some deeper work. And I use these questions with all of my clients. Perfect. Great. Well, I am so happy that we had you today. I'm so happy you educated us that you gave me some you gave me some mini therapy and coaching today. Um, so I appreciate it. Um, selfishly. Um, do you have any final words that you believe our ladies today before we close out? Yeah, I would just tell people if you want to connect with me, then you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Ebony Online. That's me on Twitter. That's me on Facebook. And if you have a question that you want to ask me, feel free to DM me. I'm happy to talk to folks all the time in the DM. And I'm just happy to be here and, and to be able to share some of that stuff. I have a bunch of resources too um, on my IGTV channel that talks about just different steps you can take to, to kind of work through therapy, find a therapist, how do you know it's working, all of that great stuff. So Instagram is full of great things and, and little bite-sized um, resources. So please go there, connect with me if, if your heart so leads you there. Yes, yes. And I, I need to hype you up one more time. Um, um, Dr. Ebony is as great of a teacher on Instagram TV as you are hearing right now. So if you love this podcast, I really encourage you to follow her because she talks about so many things, including the things that she shared with us today. So thank you so much. You're welcome so much. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, so thanks for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoy what you learned today, it doesn't have to stop here. Check out the Black Girls Heal website at blackgirlsheal.org for more resources to help you heal from intimacy disorders like love addiction and love avoidance. The best time to start or restart your healing journey is now. You can grab a free copy of our five-step roadmap to heal love addiction, love avoidance, and love deprivation by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash roadmap. And if you're on social media, feel free to follow us at Black Girls Heal on Instagram and Facebook.